Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Anna Allred, and I'll be your host for this webinar. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box, and I can address your concerns. You're welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments, insights, and questions. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Our next webinar is um, on May 19th, and it is still to be determined. Um, for uh, if you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday for your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, and who will be giving a presentation on Census 101 basic, basics, benefits, and cautions. Um, it should be great. So um, Catherine, after years on sidelines, Catherine began doing family history. Somewhat to her surprise, she discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is helping new family historians find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library and presents at other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. In addition, she's a regular contributor to the Family Search blog. Catherine works as a technical writer and instructional designer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Her current work assignments include developing training used on mobile devices. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and spring lilacs. Um, and Catherine, if you're ready, we'll turn over the time to you. Super. Anna, thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, can you guys see my screen okay? I, I assume that the raised hands mean we're good, so thank you very much. Well, everybody, welcome to this webinar today. I am really excited about this and also so grateful that you could join us. The census is so widely used in family history research, and my hope is that this will be valuable to you in your own family history. So here is what is on the agenda for today. We're going to try to get a better understanding of census records in these, these um, several areas. First of all, the basics of the census. Then we'll talk about the benefits, in other words, how they help us with family history. Then we're going to go through some cautions because using the census is maybe not always as simple as it seems like it should be or like it sounds. And then finally, we're going to end up with some tips that will help you to get the most out of the census. Okay, let's dive into the first topic, basics. We're going to talk about the what, why, when, and how of the census. To get us all on the same page, I've noticed a lot of times whenever you try to define something, we might think that we know what it is, but then when we try to articulate it, it's not as easy as maybe we had thought it would be. So I thought it would help us to get on the same page and define what a census really is. Essentially, it's a count and description of a population. Now, that population could be a small area of a country, it could be an entire country, and sometimes it can even be multiple countries. But the basic important thing to remember is that it's a count and a description of some certain population. It's usually taken by a government or less frequently by a church. Church censuses are kind of rare, but they're pretty valuable. But most of the time, you'll find that it's taken by a government. Census, censuses are usually taken at regular intervals. And especially in modern times, they're done every 10 years. And finally, they're usually taken on a specific date or within a specific date range. So, for example, as I recall, the England 1911 census, I want to say it was done on April 1st or April 2nd, but it was supposed to be a record of everybody that was living in England and where they were living on that specific date. So why do governments and sometimes churches take censuses? Well, the most common reasons, especially for governments, are listed here on the screen. Taxation is a big one. And if we think back to the Bible, that was the reason for the census around the time of Christ. And then also governments use 
information from censuses for military purposes. And then especially more recently, they can be used for uh, to, to draw voting districts or legislative districts, that type of thing. There are some other reasons that are maybe less common, at, at least historically. They're more common in modern times. So a census can be used, for instance, to determine government funding. It can be used for city planning, or it could even be used for the allocation of emergency services. You might think, and I actually had someone uh, mention to this to me one time, that they assumed that the census was just kind of either an American thing or an England thing. But interestingly enough, censuses have been taken all over the world. So yes, we have kind of the ones, since this, is, uh, this webinar is offered by the BYU Family History Library, I'm assuming that a lot of you probably are English speakers and you're familiar with the Canada, England, United States censuses. But take a look at where censuses are also taken around the world. They're taken in, not surprisingly, actually, if you know the census is taken in England, well, it's also taken in Wales and Scotland, Northern Ireland and Ireland. Censuses are also taken in Central and Latin America, in Europe, in India, in Russia, in the Philippines, in Australia, in Japan, and in Africa, and in China. So the census is not just a, an American phenomenon or a first world phenomenon, but there's a good chance of you finding a census in most of the places that you're doing research in. So if you want more information about a specific census in a specific country, I would refer you to the Family Search Wiki, which is absolutely amazing. This link is live. So when you look at the slide deck, you can just click this link. But if you um, Google Family Search Wiki, you'll also easily get to the wiki. And then once you're there, just search for whatever your location is. So for instance, if I wanted to look for the India census, I would just do a search for India census or Russia census or whatever you're looking for. Now, all that being said, in today's webinar, we are going to focus most on examples from Canada, the United States and England. One reason for that is because those are the ones that I'm most familiar with. But then another reason is, the principles that we'll talk about for these can be widely applied. So I think we can simplify the examples and focus on a few geographies. But I just hope as we go through the class today that you'll keep that in mind, that you can apply the principles we talk about to most other censuses in most other areas. So let's look at an anatomy of a census. What can you expect to find on a census record? Well, first of all, you can expect to find the location where the census was taken and the date on which it was taken. Sometimes it'll be at the top of each page. Sometimes it will be listed at the beginning, like the first page of a set of pages for a certain location. Then also, you're likely to find some indication of the residence, not just the big location where it was taken, but you might see a village or a neighborhood or even down to the street or address level. So it may actually give you a house number. Not always, but I've seen that on census records. You'll find that as you go through most censuses, they are listed by some type of dwelling. And usually those are homes. So the census taker would just walk down the street and take the count of everybody in every house along that street. You can see that there are five different dwellings indicated on this page that we're looking at. But dwelling wasn't just limited to homes. It can include ships and hospitals. I've seen it include, for instance, um, mental asylums, hotels, things like that. So most of the time, again, it'll be a home, but it's not limited to an individual family dwelling. Here's a thing that trips people up sometimes. In most censuses that I've seen, there will be some numbering system on the far left of the page. And it is usually a way for the enumerator to keep track of the houses. So they, but sometimes these numbers get confused for house numbers, but almost never in my experience is that enumerator column the same thing as the house number. The house number 
may very well be listed in a different column like the residents column, but be really careful to be sure that you're interpreting the, the numbers in the columns correctly. And the easiest way to do that is just look at the column header and make sure what it is. This one's a little hard to read on this image, but it says number of schedule, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's referring to the enumerator schedule. So it just means this was house 167 that he enumerated, there's 168 and so forth, but it doesn't have any correspondence to the actual house number. On most censuses, not all, but most and especially modern day censuses, you will see relationships listed. So the head of the household will be listed first, and then the different relationships to the head of household will be listed. So in this example, in case this is small for you to see, the head of household is George Geldert, and he's uh, designated as the head. Then next is, his, is Mary J, Mary Jane, his wife, and she is listed as wife to the head of household. Then we have Elizabeth, and she's listed as daughter to the head of household. And then, of course, you've got personal information for each person. This typically includes at least the person's name, age, sex, marital status, occupation, and birthplace. I, I thought it might be interesting for you to look and see how census records have evolved over the years. So all censuses are not created equal and early, early census records are actually quite a bit different from the census records that probably we'll usually be using in our genealogical research. So this census record that you're looking at is from the 1790 US Census. And there's a few things that are worth pointing out. First of all, this census only lists the head of household. So these names down here are not all members of one family. These are heads of household in the order in which they were enumerated. Other members of the family are counted just by category. So for instance, there could be a column for males under age 15. The other thing that you probably noticed about this is that the form is completely hand drawn. It's not printed, even though the printing press was available. But for whatever reason, they had the enumerators draw out the um, table, if you will, or whatever, the way that they were going to collect the census information. The next kind of major step in the evolution of the census it is represented by this page from the 1851 England census. And on this page, you'll notice that all household members are listed, not just the head of household. And then also more information is included. For instance, we've got residences and occupations and birthplaces. And to the gratitude of family historians everywhere, they began to use printed forms. In fact, I don't know exactly when they started printed forms in England. I know that they were using them by 1841. And different countries will vary. But as you get farther into the 1800s, you're more likely to see printed forms. And that just makes it so nice for consistency's sake and for readability. And then, of course, which probably won't surprise any of us living in our modern civilization, as time progressed, governments wanted more information. So you will find that censuses get more complicated and more detailed as the years progress. This is an example from Canada, and you notice that it goes way beyond just the person's name and their age and birthplace and so forth. But we've got, often you'll find things like educational information, employment information, uh, even salaries and so forth, lots of different things, whatever the government wanted to collect. And it varies year by year. So it will rarely, when they start collecting this level of detail, I've noticed that it's rarely the same from year to year. And I thought you might be interested to know what some of the other fun things are that might show up on a census, especially things that are genealogically useful. So in the first row here, you see that in the US 1900 and the England 1911 censuses, they will tell you the years that the couple has been married, which is a great boon if you're looking for a marriage record or a marriage date, right? And this amazing one is that they will tell you the number of children born to the current marriage 
the number of children living, and then in the England census, they tell you the number of children deceased. In the US census, of course, you can compute that from the number of children living. Wait a second, did I say that wrong? So I'm, I'm looking in my head in England, it's um, total number of children, then number living and number deceased. In the US census, it's going to be total children and total living, but it's still the same information. In other words, it tells you how many children that couple had and how many are deceased and may possibly not be listed in any census. Going down to the next row, then the U.S. 1930, excuse me, U.S. 1900 to 1930 censuses tell us when our ancestors immigrated and what year they were naturalized. That can be incredibly helpful if you're trying to find out, if you're trying to research your ancestor in the old country. So you may know, okay, I've got them in America from 1870 on but they were all born in Scandinavia. So how do I make that leap across the ocean? Well, this immigration information can help you do that. Canada, the 1921 census, they list the religion, which can be amazingly helpful if you're looking for church records. This one, next one is not necessarily so genealogically useful, but it's just kind of cool. It's interesting. You know how excited we get about new technology, whether it's a new tablet or a phone or whatever it might be. Well, back in 1930, the new technology was radio. And so they asked people, do you own a radio? And that's fun to look back on your ancestors and see, you know, were they able to, to have this exciting new technology in their home? In the 1940 census, there's a really cool column that um, asks where you were living in 1935. So if you're having trouble tracing a family, at least you've got something, some indication of where they were five years earlier. And then this is the first U.S. census that I'm aware of that asked about income. And this is a little bit of, of trivia for you. They actually decided on purpose to make the income question the last one that they asked because they assumed rightly that it was a sensitive subject and that some people might get offended at the government wanting to know their income. So they figured if they put it last on the census form and the person kicked them out and wouldn't give them the information, at least they got all the other information before they asked for the income. And finally, just to take us up to modern day, this is an image of the 2020 U.S. Census questionnaire. And so you can see we've totally gone digital here with no hand-drawn forms. You just um, click the certain box. In fact, if I remember right, I believe this form could be completed online or by printing out. So you had your choice. You could do it totally digitally if you chose to. Okay, so with that as a background, what are the benefits of using censuses in family history research? We're going to, going to go over four key benefits. The first one is that it gives a snapshot of a family at a particular time. So we, all of us, haven't been alive in 1881, right? The only way that we can see what that family was at that time, what the composition of that family was, where they lived, um, what their occupations and so forth were, we have to rely on historical records. And the census is wonderful for giving us that snapshot of a family. But not only that, when a census is taken to get, when census records are taken together over time, they give you more than just that snapshot. They give you an entire picture, sometimes over generations. So here, for example, we start out in 1881. We've got James and Caroline, his wife, and they've got four kids. Well, 10 years later, oops, sorry, didn't mean to do that. 10 years later, they've added four kids to the family and they've still got the other children. But 10 years later, James and Caroline are heading towards being empty nesters. They've just got the, the youngest kids left. And by 1911, James is gone and just the youngest child is left living with her mother. So you can see, I just, I feel so sad sometimes when people talk about historical records being boring. 
because I think they're anything but. As we look at this, we see this family. You can just picture in your mind this young family starting out and this poor mom struggling with these young kids and, you know, no no indoor, well, I shouldn't say indoor plumbing. I really don't know what the state was then, but I'm quite sure they didn't have electrical washers and dryers and dishwashers and so forth. So she's washing clothes by hands and diapers by hand and everything. Then by here, she's got what? Seven, did I say four before? I guess it's three extra kids. She's got a total of seven children that she's um, being a mother to and being a homemaker for. So we can just empathize with what she was going through. And then a lot of people can empathize with getting to the empty nest stage of life. And um, you just go through and you see what this family was, what their life story was. And I think that is just so intriguing and so fascinating. Census records help us see that. Then another thing that census records do, which I find incredibly valuable, is that they provide information that helps us to verify other records. In other words, whether those records really are for our ancestors. I wanted to walk you through just a fun example that happened on my Bescoby line. So you notice I've highlighted Francis's, it, it, this is for Francis Grant Bescoby. And what we're looking at here, by the way, is called a timeline grid. And we'll be talking about it a little bit later, but it's just a table that allows you to capture census information very easily. So we've got the certain census up here at the top. This is 1841, 51, et cetera. Then we've got the information that was provided in that census for the person that is listed here in the first column. So notice that Francis has a kind of unusual occupation. He's a whitesmith. Now, probably a lot of us have heard of blacksmith, but whitesmith? So I had to look it up. I did not know what it was. It has two possible um, meanings for England at this time. A whitesmith, whitesmith could either be somebody that finished blacksmith work. So they might do the polishing or different things like that. Or they could be a person that worked with lighter metals, most often tin. Well, the census doesn't tell us which one Francis did, but at least we know he was a white Smith, Smith worker. And it was consistent through all the years, except that I couldn't find him in the 1851. But I did find that he married a woman named Elizabeth Mills in 1855, and that's the Elizabeth that, oh, wait, it's not on here. So on my real timeline grid, Elizabeth is in the next row. And so she shows up with, with Francis. And on the marriage, everything, I could tell it was their marriage because everything lined up. The names were correct, et cetera. The occupation especially was correct. He was listed on the marriage record as a whitesmith. So I know that they got married in 1855. Well, when I added all this information to family tree, I got a hint for a possible child named Eliza Bescoby. But you guys might already be looking at this and saying, hmm, I see some questionable things here. In other words, I couldn't just look at this and go, oh, yeah, totally. This is Eliza. It's got to be their daughter. Here are the red flags that I saw. First of all, Eliza never appeared with the family in the census. Well, could she have died as a baby? Yeah, of course she could. But this was at least something I wanted to check out because she never was with the family in the census. The other thing was, I don't know if you noticed from the screen before, but Francis and his family were always either in Nottinghamshire or in Lincolnshire. So here we he had a brief stint apparently in Lincolnshire, and then he went back to Nottingham, back to Nottingham, or still in Nottingham. So as far as I could tell, the family never lived in Kent. And so that was also a red flag to me. And you might be saying, well, Francis Bescoby, that's a pretty unusual name. And you're absolutely right. It is unusual among all names. But guess what? It's not unusual in my Bescoby family. There was a Francis Bescoby like born in, I don't know, 1600 or something. And ever since that time, 
every generation of Bescobies has used Francis over and over and over. I kid you not, I've got dozens of Francis Bescobies in my line. So the fact that he was Francis really didn't help me a whole lot. And especially the fact that he was living in an area where I would not expect him to live made me really question whether I could confidently say that Eliza was his daughter. So I decided to look up Eliza's christening with the hope that I could find an, a father's occupation to prove or disprove. And I wish that we were in a live classroom because I'd ask for a show of hands or, or ask you to just um, say what you see in this record that lets you know one way or the other whether this Eliza really is my Francis's daughter. Well, if you said Whitesmith, you're absolutely right. And because that's such a unique occupation, and because this christening took place about nine months after the marriage, a, a little bit less, but um, back then that actually, at least on my lines, that's not that unusual for a couple to get married when the woman is already pregnant. And so I, the, the, um, Dates are lining up, the occupation is lining up. The other thing of interest to note on this is this uh, little abbreviation out in the margin. It's hard to read, but it says PB, and it stands for private baptism. At this time in England, private baptisms were pretty much only performed if you felt that the child was at a high risk of passing away, of dying. And so they apparently knew that Eliza probably was not going to live very long. And so they wanted to be sure that she was baptized before she was passed, before she passed away. Well, the other bonus from that, so that made me confident that Eliza really was the daughter of my Francis, and that actually helped me find him in the 1851 census, and I don't actually remember at this point if I'd found this census and ruled it out because it was Kent, but then knowing that he and his wife had lived in Kent and had a baby there, I thought, I'll go back and double check, and sure enough, there was Francis. He wasn't married yet, because remember, he got married in 55, but he was a lodger, and he was living in the county of Kent, and he was still a whitesmith. So that is a good example of how a census record can help us verify that other records really do pertain to our family. And the last thing that I love using census records for is clues to other family members. Just like today, you know, you may have a grandmother living with you or an aunt or a nephew or something like that. Same thing in probably every country of the world in all time periods. So what we're looking at right here on the screen is the census record for George Mills and his wife, Caroline. They've got a girl named Mary Jane, and they've got a son, so that's all pretty straightforward so far, but look who else is living with them. We've got George Moses Geldard, who is listed as the father-in-law, and remember, that's to the head of household, which means, logically, he has to be Caroline's dad. And then we've got John, listed as the brother-in-law to the head of household, which means he has to be Caroline's brother which means we now know two of Caroline's family members plus her maiden name. Not only that, we've got a nephew down here. Well, his last name is Galley. So now we know that either one of George's or Caroline's sisters married somebody named Galley. And same thing with Margaret. We know that either one of George's or Caroline's sister sisters married a Hudson. But interesting thing. You do need to be a little bit careful interpreting things in the census because I immediately saw this and I thought, oh, Marianne must be Margaret's daughter. But look over here where it says how many children she has had. It says none. And so maybe this is her husband's child by a previous marriage. Um, I don't know at this point. I actually haven't researched it. But we, we can't say now that this is Margaret's daughter. We cannot say that. In fact, we have proof to the contrary. So do you see how this, how censuses can give us really important clues to other relatives and they can help us build our family tree? 
Okay, with all those very cool aspects of the census, of course, there's always cautions. There's always cautions with everything, right? So we want to look at some of the gotchas that could trip you up if you weren't aware of them. One thing to be very aware of is that a census, a single census, never gives a complete picture of a family. What's missing from one census? Well, for one thing, it only shows that family on a specific date or a small date range. They could have had a baby right after. Somebody could have died right after. They could have moved right after. So you can't necessarily extrapolate a lot from the fact that the sense that the family appeared in this location and there were they, these people on this certain date. Another thing that the census will almost never list, in fact, in my experience, I can't think of any time it's listed, is other spouses. So it won't list those that are deceased or divorced. It will also not show family members who have moved out. So you might find a census and say, oh, this family had four kids. But if you just based your conclusion on that one census, well, what if the earlier census showed that they had three other kids that by this time of the census you're looking at, had moved out. So again, not a complete picture. And then finally, it doesn't show deceased family members, for example, and especially children that were born between censuses. So the bottom line for that is you never want to rely on just one census to give you a complete picture of the family. And in the census, you are likely to see errors. I, I think all of us who have used the census, we know that we see these types of errors literally all the time. That's not an exaggeration. The most frequent errors you're going to see or variations will be in names, relationships, and ages. In my experience, less often you may see errors in birthplaces, gender, and marital status. But by far, the most errors seem to be made in these categories, names, relationships, and ages. In order, so then you might be saying, well, gosh, how did all these errors get in? I mean, how hard can that be? Don't you just write down everybody in the family and shouldn't it all be perfect and reliable? Well, it sounds good, but in order to understand how errors can creep into the census, let's take a look at how the census gets from here when the original enumerator is interviewing the person to that beautiful digital image that we see when we search online. So here is a, the basic census process. This will vary from year to year and from country to country, but in general terms, this is what you're looking at. So the first thing is that a census taker or otherwise known as, as an enumerator will be assigned to count everybody in a certain geographic area. Then the enumerator goes and visits every dwelling and records all the information by hand. And of course, we're talking about um, the censuses that we're most likely to use for genealogical purposes, that we're still looking at censuses that were recorded initially by hand. Then here's the interesting thing that a lot of people aren't aware of, that the enumerator was required to submit their paper forms to the government office. Now, take just take a minute and imagine yourself as an enumerator. Let's go back and look at that picture. So here's this poor guy holding this huge pad of census forms. He's holding it up with one hand. He's got a pen or a pencil in the other hand. It's maybe a hot day, maybe he's sweating, maybe it rained, but you can imagine that by the time the enumerators submit those paper forms to the government office, they're probably in most cases not going to be looking too good. So very often at the government office, workers would be required to make copies of the original forms by hand so that the, the official record kept by the government would not be the original enumerator's notepad, but it would be a clean, beautiful copy. Most of the time when we look at digital censuses, that's what we're looking at. Then fast forward to technology, uh, entities like FamilySearch or other genealogical organizations would microfilm and or digitize these records. And then finally, 
those digitized images would be indexed by volunteers. Well, just looking at this, you can probably tell where the errors could creep in, but let's just call that out. The first thing is that when the enumerator was visiting each household, the poor guy, I mean, you know, after he's been writing for hours, you can imagine that he's pretty tired. Maybe the writing is sloppy. Um, maybe the family wasn't home and the neighbor gave the information. But it's easy to see how errors could creep in during the actual enumeration process. And sometimes, honestly, people lied. They lied about, lied about their age or you know something else that they didn't want publicly known. So there were a number of ways that errors could creep in during the actual enumeration. But as you probably could surmise, when these office workers are making hand copies of the original forms, that's another time that errors could creep in. And again, I have utmost empathy for them that they're copying pages and pages from probably hard to read original documents. Maybe they're sloppy, maybe they're smudged, and they're doing the best they can to copy those ones. Then the last place where errors can creep in is indexing. And all of us as index volunteers, we try to do our best but you know what, we make mistakes. It's just part of being human. So there will be indexing errors creep in as well. So that's how, you know, at these three touch points, that's the most likely places that those errors will creep into the census. So I wanted to give you some examples. I know sometimes, I, I, most of us who have used the census realize how error prone it is, but sometimes, especially beginners are, are troubled and maybe even disbelieving of the number of errors in the census. So I just wanted to point out a few of them. And I also want to point out that these were actually very easy to find. These were just pulled out of my own research uh, and there were just because there were so many. So the first one is, what do you think of this guy's name? Have you ever heard Beth as a middle name? I definitely haven't. And in England at that time, I can tell you that was definitely not a common name. In fact, I don't think I'd ever heard of it. Well, if you look at other records, they strongly indicate that the middle name is Benjamin. And just in defense of this indexer, I looked at the image and it really did look like Beth. The handwriting was not easy to read. So I can totally see why this name got indexed incorrectly. Another example, wrong birthplace. Here's a timeline grid for Joseph Burt and his wife, Susanna. You notice that his birthplace is consistent until you get to 1881. Same thing for his wife, at which time, I guess the poor census taker was either tired or didn't hear very well, but they wrote down two non-existent places. So, um, and you notice the county even changed for Joseph. It changed from Huntingdon to Hampshire. And so if I had just added this family based on the 1881 census, it would have brought up wrong record hints. It could have, I should say, could have brought up wrong record hints. It could have brought up wrong duplicates, all kinds of problems just because this birth information was not correct. Ages. I've mentioned before in some of my webinars how it's kind of funny that women sometimes will not age a whole 10 years between 10 year censuses. That's not exactly what happened here, but it's still kind of interesting that here's Sarah. She actually married into my Bescovy family and she's 31 in the 1851 census. Well, by the next census, she's only aged seven years. And I looked at the image and it very distinctly says 38. There's no question that it's a 38. So who knows what happened? But this this clearly there's something, something's not right here. She can't have only aged seven years in 10 years. She probably wishes she did. Then we've got back to the 1871 census. She's back online with the 51. And then by 1881, still that's, you know, given that an age depending on when it falls um, compared to the date the census was taken, we can allow for variation in the age. So that doesn't trouble me. So I'm thinking that this really should have been, um, let's see, 30, 40, 50, 60, something. Okay, something actually, I hadn't thought this through until I started talking this through. All we can conclude at this point is something's definitely wrong with the ages here. And we would have to do some extra looking to see what her, um, 
what her birth year really was, what we what what would be the best estimate based on the ages. Okay, here's an example of a wrong gender. So this individual, I don't know if you can read that, but um, they wrote down the name as Philander, which is just strikes me as being quite unfortunate. And they wrote down this person as a male. But guess what? When I looked at the other records for this person, it became clear that it was not a male and her name was Felinda or something very close to that. I, I just my heart goes out to her. I will bet you that just about everybody always got her name wrong at first. As you can see from the census, we've got Felinda or excuse me, the marriage. We've got Felinda census. We've got Felina here. We've got Felana. And so um, I actually am not yet confident of what her name really was, but this is definitely a lot better than Philander. And she um, definitely was a woman. That was the only record in that one census where she was listed as a male, but guess how she got entered in family tree. I was actually helping somebody and that person didn't enter her, but somebody had just based her off that census. I think, was it 18? Oh, I didn't list it here. I'm pretty sure it was the 1880 census and somebody had just used one census to enter her. And so she was entered in correctly. And for those of you who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, her temple work was done based on, on that incorrect information. So that's a good reason to be careful of of using census records. And another example I wanted to show you is, uh, this one is a combination of a wrong name and a wrong relationship. So in the 1881, we've got William Russell, who is stated to be the nephew of the head of household. This mother, don't pay attention to that because that's actually just the ancestry form, but he was listed as the nephew to the head of household. But in 1891, he was listed as the son of actually the same woman. And so we've got an, an indexing error here where her name, it really was Boyington and it was indexed as Borsington. And again, in defense of the poor indexer, the handwriting was really hard to read. And then also for whatever reason, the information was wrong on the image. William was listed as Mary's son, but she was in, he was in fact her nephew. And I couldn't have told that from the census. I had to look in other records to prove it. Not only the other census records, but other records for William, such as birth and death records. Okay, so what I definitely don't want to do right now is to make you say, oh my goodness, if the census is that bad, why use it? So let me ask you, do we throw the baby out with the bathwater? And my answer to that would be absolutely not. The census is amazing. And my purpose in pointing out these errors is just to help you be aware of them so that you can enter the information as accurately as possible. I like to think of the census kind of like a favorite old car. Just because our car doesn't work perfectly, especially if it's a Mustang, we don't just get rid of it, right? We don't junk it. It may have its quirks, but we love it. And if we're careful, it helps us get where we want to go. So given all the things that we've talked about today, what are some tips? We're going to end up with this. What are a few tips for using the census, getting the most out of it while avoiding the problems? The first thing is, again, never depend on just one census. That's just asking for inaccuracy. Uh, and I just uh, refer us again to this example that we've already talked about. And then also always check the image. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that, as in this example, there can be indexing errors. So we have a Walter Cheers. I'm not even sure how to say that because it's not a real name. And the indexer did the best that they could because look at this handwriting. But because of other records for this family, I know that their last name is really Chivers or um, I guess that's how you pronounce it, but it's definitely not 
this spelling up here. And so checking the image will allow you to look at the name and see what it really, you know, do your best to interpret what it really is. But then also images will often have information that isn't indexed, such as occupations. And as you saw, that can be really helpful in doing our family history and proving other records. If the, here's a big gotcha for the census. And this is a mistake that is easy to make, especially when we're new, when we're just starting out using census records. A common standard across every genealogical site that I'm aware of is that married women, regardless of how many times they married, they should be listed as listed in your family tree under their birth names or their married surnames. That's just to avoid confusion, because you can imagine if a woman marries multiple times, well, which married name do you use? And if you put her in under her married name, what if that's the same name as another woman's birth name? Then you could get wrong record hints, you could get wrong duplicate hints, all things like that. So here's a good example, actually, revisiting our Sarah, who married into my Bescoby line, in 1851, she's with her first husband, and in 1861, so she's got a surname from her first marriage, and at this point, we don't know her maiden name. Then in the next two censuses, she's under Bescoby. It actually took me a while. This was a tricky one, but ultimately, I was able to find her christening record, and her a birth name or maiden surname is actually Swaby. So when I entered her in family tree, I needed to enter her as Swaby, not as Garnett or as Bescoby. But if I had only used the census, then I wouldn't have had her birth surname. So you always want to look as much as possible, try and find the birth surname of a woman who is married in the census. Censuses, a best practice for using the census is to always look for missing children. As we mentioned, there's some censuses that make that really easy, such as the England 1911 census, where it tells you the total kids born alive, number still living, and the number who have died. So if you look through all the censuses, for instance, and I actually don't know that this is the case, I'm just speaking theoretically here, but suppose that we looked back through the census and we always only ever found six children. We never found a total of seven children in past censuses. Then we know that there's probably a baby who died between censuses and we would know where to look for that, for that missing child. But the other thing, what about the censuses that don't tell you how many children were born to that couple? Well, you can look for gaps. So here we've got a huge gap between Jesse and Dan, another gap between Edward and John, and between John and Percy. Now, we don't want to always jump to a conclusion that that means that there were children that died between the census, because another scenario is that one of the partners had a spouse who died, and then they didn't remarry for several years. And then they wouldn't be having children during that time. Then they married and then had children with the new spouse. So that can also account for the gap. But the gaps will help you determine, um, you know, if there are missing children and if so, who they are. Here's another gotcha for the census, and that is to verify the correct parents. So when you look at this, it's pretty logical to say, well, we've got Charles Hollingworth, he's the head, we've got Mary Ann, she's the wife, and son, Arthur, daughter, Joyce, and another daughter, Barbara, and then we've got a, a Florence, a servant. Pretty straightforward, right? Except that it's not. So the truth is that these three children are Charles's children from a previous marriage. So if I had connected them to Charles and Marianne, they would be connected to the wrong mother. And the way I found that out was by looking in other censuses and looking at other birth records. So again, this is a great example of why you can't rely on one census record and you can't take it at face value. You always want to dig a little deeper to make sure that you're representing that family accurately. And also, here's another example I wanted to share with you, is that in the census, stepchildren are not always listed as such. So just looking at this 1901 census, I see Albert here. He's listed as a son of Fred Smith and Elizabeth. 
So I could conclude that he's the son of Fred and Elizabeth, but guess what? When I look back to the earlier census, here he is with his mom, Eliza, and her first husband, John Robinson. So he is actually not a Smith. He's a Robinson. And he's not a son to the head of household. He's a stepson to the head of household. But we can forgive the enumerators, right? I mean, if somebody didn't tell them that it's a stepson, or if the neighbor gave the information and didn't know it was a stepson, it's so easy for these minor types of errors to creep into the census. Well, let's take a look at 1911. There we see Albert again. He's with the same parents, with Fred and Eliza, uh, who apparently also went by Elizabeth at one point. Here he's got his correct last name, but notice he was listed again just as a son, and somebody came in afterward and wrote step. And so you always want to verify those relationships in the census just because they say son or daughter doesn't mean that they are. And again, as we saw with William, one time he was listed as a son, but he was actually a nephew. And the other thing that we want to do is verify the information with other records. So I think this is our final example for today, but this is kind of a cool one. So this is Albert that we were just looking at in the, the census when he's a one-year-old living with his mom, Eliza, and his dad, John. Well, further up the page, there's another John Robinson. I'm thinking there's probably some relationship here. We've got him being 22, this guy being 47, could be a son, less likely to be a brother, but I, I still bet there's a relationship and I'd like to try to verify that. I can't just jump to the conclusion that this John is the son of this John based on the fact that they're living next door in the census. So. I do a little searching and I find a marriage record and guess what it says? Ooh, I should have called out one thing. Notice that this John is a waiter for his occupation. This John is a tailor. So we go to the marriage record for John James Robinson and Eliza Ann Bescoby. And so I, I'm very confident this is my family and look at his occupation. He's a waiter and look at his dad's name and his dad's occupation totally lines up with the census. So now I'm very confident that that John Robinson living next door to my John is his dad. And I've just extended my family back a generation by verifying that. The last hint that I wanted to give is just the, to encourage you to use some method to capture census information that lets you see it all at once. My favorite is the timeline grid. Here's a link that will give you more information because the purpose of this webinar is not to go deep into it. But if you go to tinyurl.com slash timeline hyphen grid, you'll find information and free templates that you can use, but it will be helpful to you to capture that information so that you kind of create a picture of your family. So I thank you for coming to this webinar today. Just in summary, we talked about census basics, how they can help you, what to watch out for, the cautions with examples, and then we finished up with tips for using the census. So with that, we are to the end. And Anna, do we have any questions? Yes, we have one right now. So if you have any questions right now, please send them into the chat box or into the question and answer. So Laura Lee Nelson said, uh, is the number of children born to the mother not necessarily the marriage, at least in the US for 1900 and 1910? Oh, that is a good distinction. Thank you so much for calling that out. And I frankly don't remember exactly what the column heading says in the English or excuse me in the U.S. censuses if somebody else knows that for sure I'd love it if you'd put it in the chat and maybe the questioner did maybe that's what you were saying is you knew that to be the case I do know that in England the the column the instructions at the top say that they are children born to the current marriage so the 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 point to be taken from that is always look at the column headings of the census to understand what those numbers mean. Thank you for that excellent question. Um, Daryl Frame said, 
uh, please post the timeline grid. Oh, you bet. I'll throw that into the chat. Let's see. Now I need to. Now you're challenging my intelligence to see if I can bring up the chat. I always have the hardest time doing that when I'm presenting. It like falls under other windows and stuff. So https colon backslash backslash tinyurl.com. You guys, I have to say it out loud or like I. I, I'm going to type it weird. So then it's tinyurl.com slash timeline hyphen grid. Okay. Oh, I just sent it to all panelists. I always do that in Zoom. Let me change it to all attendees and I will, I will copy it and paste it again. Okay. So there's a link in the chat. If you click on that, it will bring up the timeline grid page and then you can bookmark it to save it. Daryl, thank you for asking about that. And I see a couple of questions in the Q&A. Anna, should I check on those or were those the ones that you just read? Those are the ones I just read. Okay, perfect. Any other questions in the chat? Um. They asked in the 1900 US census. Oh, this is Laura Lee responding. Oh, so it says in the 1900 US census, it says mother of how many children? So she's perfect. Confirming that. Laura Lee, thank you for confirming that. We appreciate it. Um, and then we have two thank yous. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And I will stop sharing. And Anna, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar, which is still to be determined. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available next week. You can view that on our YouTube channel or our website. If you have any comments or questions, you can always email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you and have a wonderful week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.